Uh, my name is Joel, if we haven't met before. Um, I'm a first year at the University of Leicester, um, and it's great to be able to bring us our reading this morning from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 to 25. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. Hashtag living my best life. That's a phrase that used to appear quite regularly on social media platforms like Instagram. And it would usually accompany sort of someone taking a selfie of themselves on holiday or having an amazing breakfast or surrounded by friends and family. And the message behind that phrase was, hey, everybody, I've cracked it. I finally achieved the good life everyone else is looking for. And I want everyone else to know about it. I am living my best life. It's a phrase that's easily parodied. Now, it's not a phrase we actually see that much in recent months on Instagram. Uh, more common really is the latest event that's been canceled or the latest depressing news cycle with hashtag 2020. But behind the often shallow use of that phrase, living my best life, is a genuine desire I suspect we all share. Again, in more serious moments, we might ask ourselves the question, so what would it look like for me to live the best life I could live? Or to put it another way, what does a fully human, flourishing life look like? That's a huge question. But I want us to see that our next bit of 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, the Apostle Peter gives us an answer to that question that we would never have expected. What does a fully human, flourishing life look like? Well, according to Peter here, it looks like following Jesus on the way of the cross. Now, what do we mean by that phrase, the way of the cross? Well, it's a way of referring to Jesus' description of the Christian life that we find in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. There, Jesus says this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily, and follow me. See, according to Jesus here, the life of a disciple, the life of a Christian, is all about denying yourself, taking up your cross daily, and following Jesus. And theologians often refer to this description of the Christian life as the way of the cross. Now, I wonder, how do you respond to that description of the Christian life? That the Apostle Peter, the man who wrote this letter of 1 Peter we've been spending some time in, was there with Jesus when Jesus first spoke these words. And the Gospels leave us in no doubt, Peter really didn't like what Jesus was saying. See, when Jesus started speaking about his own suffering and death, we're told that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. That's Matthew 16, verse 22. See, what's Peter saying? He's saying, well, what are you talking about, Jesus? Suffering, rejection, death? This isn't what I signed up for. You're getting it wrong, Jesus. See, when Peter first heard Jesus describe the way of the cross, Peter hated it. And in that initial reaction, I suspect Peter was speaking for most of us. See, following Jesus on the way of the cross just doesn't sound like living our best life. But over time, Jesus showed Peter that following him on the way of the cross really is the best life any of us can live. 
And here in 1 Peter 2 verses 18 to 25, Peter wants everyone reading this letter to see and celebrate the life Jesus suffered and died to win for us. A life of love and service. A life of forgiveness and a fresh start. A life of joy, Peter insists. Now back in verse 12 of chapter 2, Peter urged his Christian readers, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. What is the good life Peter calls his readers to live? Well, Peter spells it out in our passage today. It's a life of following Jesus on the way of the cross. So let's listen to what Peter has to say here. Keep your Bibles open at 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, in this middle section of his letter, Peter is addressing some different groups within the churches he's writing to, churches scattered across what is now modern day Turkey. So in chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, Peter addresses married Christians, both wives and husbands. And here in chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, Peter addresses slaves in the churches he's writing to. Now, what do we know about the slaves Peter is writing to here? Well, we know that slavery was widespread in the first century. One estimate puts that maybe one quarter of the population of the Roman Empire were, in fact, slaves. And from other New Testament letters, it seems that many of the early Christians were slaves. So the Apostle Paul, his letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians, also address slaves directly. Now, it's impossible for us to hear the word slave today without thinking of the horrific degradations of people that occurred in the slave trade of the 18th and 19th centuries. So it's helpful to note maybe in some ways that slavery in the first century was different. First of all, really, people of any and all ethnic and racial groups could become slaves in the Roman Empire. It wasn't one ethnic group enslaving another. And actually, first century slaves could have a wide variety of jobs. They could be managers, doctors, nurses, teachers. They were normally paid for their services and they could often expect to eventually purchase their own freedom by saving their wages. But at the same time, while first century slavery wasn't quite as dehumanizing as slavery in the 18th and 19th centuries, still no one particularly wanted to be a slave. Slaves are the most vulnerable people in society. They still would have been looked down upon by everyone else. But I want us to notice here, not by Peter. Peter addresses Christian slaves as fellow believers here. He addresses them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And the slaves Peter's writing to, they are part of that glorious vision, that glorious community of the church that we've been looking at in verse 9 of chapter 2 here. So the slaves, they are part of God's chosen people, his royal priesthood, his holy nation, his special possession. But more than that, even, it quickly becomes clear that by addressing slaves here, Peter's addressing everyone who follows Jesus in this world. Look back at chapter 2 and verse 16, addressing all Christians there. Peter urges us, live as God's slaves. That's chapter 2, verse 16. And look ahead to verses 21 to 25. Peter wants all his readers to see that Jesus, the Son of God, entered our world and humbled himself to save us, even to the point of dying a slave's death on the cross. See, through his life and death, Jesus gives astonishing dignity to the lowly and the oppressed. He gives astonishing dignity to slaves. And more than that, as we're about to see, Jesus calls on everyone who believes in him to follow him on the way of the cross, the way of service and submission and suffering. So back to verses 18 to 20. Well, what does Peter say specifically to these Christian slaves here? We can summarize his words like this. Be willing to suffer unjustly verses 18 to 20. Be willing to suffer unjustly. That's verse 18. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Now, Peter's using the same language he used back in verse 13 when he urged his readers to submit yourselves to every human authority. 
Now, just as in verse 13, the submission is to be a willing submission. Submit yourselves, says Peter. Choose to submit. And just as in verse 13, Peter's under no illusions that the masters these Christians are submit to will always be good and considerate. He knows that many of them will be harsh and unjust. So these Christian slaves may ask themselves, well, well, why should we submit ourselves to harsh masters? And Peter answers that in verse 19. For it is commendable, he says, if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. How can a Christian bear up under unjust suffering? By remembering that God is with them in their suffering. Peter wants to reassure these slaves here, you're never alone in your suffering. God is with you and you can trust him in it. You can know that God cares for you. You can know that he sees everything that is happening to you and that ultimately in the end, he will right every wrong. See, Peter urges his readers, be willing to suffer unjustly in this world, all the time remembering God is with you And he will work through your suffering to give you a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ, the one who suffered for us. And it's at this point that Peter broadens his focus beyond just the slaves in the churches he's writing to, to include every man, woman and child who puts their trust in Jesus. See, in verses 21 to 25, Peter wants all his readers to see something. The sufferings of Jesus are the pattern for the Christian life. We are all called to follow Jesus on the way of the cross. Peter is explicit about that in verse 21. To this you were called, he says, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. See, these are the two sides of Jesus suffering on the cross for us. Christ suffered for you. Jesus went to the cross to save us. And Christ leaves you an example. Jesus went to the cross to transform us, to show us a different way of living in this world. And Peter's convinced we need to grasp hold of both those truths if we're going to be able to live the good lives he urges us to back in verse 12. So let's look at each of these in turn. First of all, Christ suffered for you. Jesus went to the cross to save us. Now to help us understand what was going on at the cross when Jesus suffered and died, Peter takes us back to one of the high points of the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah's great song of the suffering servant. Now, it's worth remembering, Peter could just have presented us with the facts of Jesus' suffering on the cross. After all, remember, he was an eyewitness of those sufferings. But instead, Peter wants us to understand why Jesus suffered on the cross. And so he takes us to Isaiah 53. You see, Peter knows something. If we had been there that first Good Friday, watching Jesus hang and suffer on that cross we'd have been tempted just to see it as yet another pointless tragedy. Just another good man killed at the hands of corrupt authorities. But you see, the prophet Isaiah tells us to see Jesus' suffering in a different light. According to Isaiah 53, Jesus was suffering and dying as our substitute and as our saviour. Here's how Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 53, the words that Peter is quoting here. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. See, Isaiah wants us to see, Peter wants us to see, at the cross, Jesus suffered in our place. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. By his wounds, we have been healed. 
Jesus went to the cross to save us. And what difference should that make to our lives here and now as we live in this world? Well, first of all, that truth needs to give us the right view of ourselves. It should humble us. See, whenever we endure suffering, we don't deserve, like the slaves Peter's addressing here, we need to remember Jesus got what we do deserve. He took our punishment. He suffered in our place. And that should humble us and lead us to worship him. See, the Apostle Peter, he he was a proud and self-reliant man when Jesus first met him. But seeing the suffering Jesus went through to save him changed Peter. It humbled him. And seeing Jesus suffer in our place at the cross... That is the part of humble and change us too. Jesus went to the cross to save us. Well, that gives us a right view of Jesus as well. Remembering Jesus' suffering sort of helps us see a glorious truth about him. See, Jesus, he's not distant or aloof from us when we suffer. He knows exactly what it feels like to suffer unjustly. And as a result, he's able to help us when we suffer unjustly. Jesus is a man familiar with suffering and he's a Lord who draws near to us in our suffering. Those are precious truths to remember. And also seeing Jesus suffering on the cross for us, it gives us the right view of God. Whenever we are going through times of of trial, of suffering, of unjust suffering, we often tempted to ask the question, well, well, does God really love me? Life is so hard right now, it doesn't feel like he loves me. And to answer that question, Peter says, look at the cross. That is the unshakable proof that the God who made you is also the God who loves you. You need never doubt God's love for you again. He proved he loved you once and for all at the cross. So take comfort from that. Rejoice in that. Take strength from that in your suffering. Christ suffered for you. Jesus went to the cross to save us. But what about the other side of Jesus' suffering on the cross that Peter wants us to see here? That Christ left us an example. That Jesus went to the cross to transform us, to change us. See, Peter wants to see in these verses that Jesus' suffering on the cross didn't just set us free from the consequences of our sin. Jesus' suffering has set us free from sin itself, from the power of sin over our lives. Just look at verse 24 here. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. It's an amazing truth here. See, thanks to Jesus suffering on the cross, Christians aren't just forgiven, we are transformed. We have died to sin and now we can live for righteousness. Now Jesus can teach us how to live lives of love in this world, the lives of love we were always created to live. These are the good lives Peter calls us to live back in verse 12, and it's what we're referring to today as the way of the cross. You see, to follow the way of the cross, says Peter, is to show the same sacrificial love Jesus showed when he went to the cross. The same submission to God the same commitment to love and serve the people around us, even when that is costly. Remember the words of Jesus that are in Peter's mind as he writes this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. See, what Jesus is calling us to here is to say no to sin and to selfishness to give over control of our lives to Jesus, whatever the cost, and to keep doing that every day of our lives. Take up your cross daily and follow me, says Jesus. And we might say, well, why do we have to do that daily? Surely that's just a once for all thing. You go, you pick up your cross and you go and die. Well, we have to do it daily, says Jesus, because really our desire to be in control won't go away. 
We keep trying to take back control of our lives. We keep giving in to sin and to selfishness. So Jesus tells us, take up your cross daily. Deny yourself daily. Keep asking Jesus to help us follow him and learn to love the people around us daily. And make no mistake, that is a humbling experience. But both Jesus and Peter assure us, following Jesus on the way of the cross will lead us to the best life we could possibly live in this world. See, by calling us to follow in Jesus' steps in verse 21, Peter's calling every Christian to live a life of love and service of others. The way of the cross is the way of love and service. Now, of course, love Well, that's a word we love. It's one of the most attractive words any of us can hear. We all want to be loved. And we've seen that actually Jesus' death on the cross for us means we know that we are loved by God. But actually it can be all too easy for us to sentimentalise love. To make love all about sort of sunsets and holding hands and warm feelings. See, for Jesus, living a life of love led him to a cross. Jesus shows us that true love is really all about service. True love is about dying to self and then seeking to help and bless the people in front of us, whoever they may be. And if we think, yep, I can do that on my own, well, we're kidding ourselves. See, one of the effects of sin in our lives is that sin curves us in on ourselves. Sin tells us the most important thing in the world is me and my needs being met. And that becomes a slavery for us. Now Jesus went to the cross to set us free from our slavery to sin. But then Peter says he's going to begin this long, often painful process of turning us outward again. So that we love God and we love the people around us. And where is the best place where Jesus is going to teach us how to love God and love the people around us? Well, the answer is by living as part of the church family Jesus has placed us in. By living in close relationship with other broken, flawed human beings. See, in the end, as much as we'd like to, we cannot learn how to live lives of sacrificial love by listening to sermons about it. Or by reading books about it or even by thinking deeply about it. We learn how to love one another sacrificially by living in relationship with other people. All the time asking Jesus to teach us and help us to love them, whatever the cost. I want us to see today every small act of service we are asked to do for someone else in the coming week is an opportunity for us to learn from Jesus how to live the life of love he has rescued us to live. See, the way of the cross isn't just about those big moments in life, those moments of persecution or even martyrdom. No, living this way begins with small daily acts of service to the people around us. In fact, those small acts of service are often more revealing of where our hearts are than the big moments can be. The American satirist uh, PJ O'Rourke put it like this. He says, well, everybody wants to save the world, but nobody wants to help mum with the dishes. I think that's so true, isn't it? We want those big moments. Yes, I'll save the world when everyone's watching. But we just don't want to do the things when no one's watching. We don't want to love and serve when no one else sees it. You see, following Jesus on the way of the cross begins with small acts of service. It begins with doing the washing up, with putting the bins out, with cleaning the bathroom. It begins with giving up your time to meet with your home group. It begins by reaching out to a friend you know is struggling and listening to them. It begins by praying for other people, not just praying for yourself. See, it's in these small acts of love and service where Jesus really teaches us how to grow in loving God and loving one another. See, the way of the cross is the way of love and service. But again, we need to be honest with ourselves. Love and service, they just don't come naturally to any of us. So what do we do when we fail 
What do we do when we fail to love the people around us? When we give in to selfishness, again, when we mess up. Well, in those moments, we need to remember something really precious. As well as being the way of love and service, the way of the cross is also the way of forgiveness and a fresh start. Just look at verse 24 again, the description of Jesus on the cross. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. By his wounds, we are healed. See, Jesus has taken the punishment we each deserve on himself so we can be forgiven and washed clean. And that is a truth we always, always need to remember. See, the way of the cross, this way of love and service, it will crush you if you forget the pardon of the cross. At the cross, Jesus won our forgiveness for us. Thanks to Jesus, everyone who trusts in him is a forgiven person. And every day is a fresh start for the Christian. No matter how yesterday went for you, God's mercies are new every morning. So we can confess our sin to God about what happened yesterday. We can be honest with him about how we've messed up. We can ask him to forgive us thanks to Jesus' death on the cross. And then we can rejoice in that forgiveness and set out to love and serve the people again with those new mercies he lavishes on us. And remember, God is using your daily need of his grace and mercy to teach you to be gracious and merciful to the people around you. See, in this passage, Peter is calling us to follow Jesus on the way of the cross, to learn from Jesus' example. And I hope we can see that in spite of first appearances, that really is the best and most fully human life we could ever live. See, the way of the cross, it's the way of love and service. It's the way of forgiveness and a fresh start. But it's also the way of joy. See, amazingly, it's as we forget ourselves by looking at the cross that we truly find ourselves as we were truly meant to be. Jesus tells us this in Luke chapter 9, verse 24, just after his description of the way of the cross. He says this, If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. See, with these words, Jesus is giving us both a challenge and a promise. The challenge is this. Well, well, how is your life of living for yourself? How is that going? How is it going just keeping your life for yourself? How happy are you living that way? Can you see that living for yourself just makes you smaller, uglier, less able to love God and love other people? But the promise Jesus makes is a, is a marvellous one. See, by calling us to follow him on the way of the cross, Jesus is calling us to live the life we were always created to live, to live the best life we could ever live. A life of love for God and a life of love for neighbour. A life that looks like Jesus in this world. A life that is truly human in the image of God. The life of love you were created to live. We began our time in 1 Peter today by asking the question, what does your best life look like? What does a fully human, flourishing life look like? Well, the answer Peter gives us is a remarkable one. It looks like following Jesus on the way of the cross, the way of love and service, the way of forgiveness and a fresh start, the way of joy. Look at verse 21 as we finish. To this you were called, says Peter, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Peter wants to see here, Jesus went to the cross to save us when we couldn't save ourselves. But Jesus also went to the cross to transform us, to show us a new way of living. Jesus went to the cross so we could live our best lives with him and for him. The lives of love and service we were always created to live. So this week, let's look to Jesus. Let's learn from Jesus how to live those lives of love and service. And let's ask him to help us do that.
for his glory and for our joy. Because it's as we lose our lives for Jesus, as we give ourselves up in love and service for him and for others, that we find our lives and we find lasting joy in his service. Mm -hmm.